So here's something I haven't done in a while, which is a uh, unboxing video. And uh, this is for Pax Britannica, which is an old uh, Victory Games title from 1985. Uh, I actually had a copy of this, but it was this beat up, you know, kind of punched and uh, crummy box copy of the game that I had gotten. and I. It may have been missing a couple of pieces even, and I got it cheaply, but uh, you know, didn't invest a lot of money in it. This was at the time that I was uh, acquiring as many VG titles, VG war game titles as I could, um, just to kind of collect all the Victory Games games, which uh, Victory Games has a good reputation uh, amongst the uh, early war gaming companies. Um, it sort of came out of the ashes of SPI. Uh, a lot of the SPI designers um, stayed with uh, Victory Games, um, which was owned by Avalon Hill, um, but was this sort of separate imprint from Avalon Hill and had uh, some more heavy war games in it than what Avalon Hill was tending to publish at the time. Um, so I, I enjoyed uh, some of the Victory Games titles that I played, notably the uh, the old uh, Victory Games Civil War title. Uh, I'm trying to think. There was Civil War, there was Hell's Highway, it was another good one, which was Market Garden. Um, and uh, the 1809 uh, Napoleon's campaigns in the Danube. And Lee versus Grant, which was like an early precursor to the great campaigns of the Civil War series. Um, so there, there was kind of these historic great titles, and two of the other titles. Um, neither of which I've played. Uh, well, there's the Korean War, that was Joe Balkowski's Korean War title. That uh, I've, I've played like the, the, the sort of the intro scenario to, um, so I haven't, haven't delved deeply into that. And then Vietnam, uh, 65 to 75, which I haven't played at all. Um, both games I own, but, but haven't actually played. And those, those two titles along with uh, the Civil War are kind of uh, what I would consider war game shelf staples um, if you're a a real avid war gamer, um, you should have those titles if you don't already. Um, but they are kind of each considered uh, one of the definitive games on that particular conflict: uh, the Korean War, Vietnam, and the Civil War. Um, but Prax Britannica it was interesting to me because it, it, it's an era that I absolutely love, um, which is this sort of late. 19th century Victorian era. Um, I've always been fascinated by the history of that era. Um, you know, sure, you have Sherlock Holmes in that period, you've got Charles Dickens, you've got Rudyard Kipling. Um, it is, you know, it is the height of the colonial era, um, which is sort of looked back on uh, askance these days, um, you know, just from a political politically correct standpoint, um, the, the colonial era is looked at as yeah, this time of exploitation. Sure, there was all this advancement, but it was also terrible exploitation and inequality, and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, I'm aware of all that history um, and all the dark side of the colonial era. It's, it's not, you know, looking at history with rose-colored glasses. It was a it was a dark era. And in fact, the title of this game is almost a little bit ironic in Pax Britannica, as though you know, there were no conflicts uh, in this era because of the sheer power of the the, uh, the British of the time, you know, like in Pax Romana. Um, there was plenty of conflict going on in the colonial era, a number of wars being fought. You know, these were all minor, largely minor conflicts, um, although, you know, some would argue that the Franco-Prussian War was not, not particularly minor. Um, this starts after the Franco-Prussian War, which was in 1870. Uh, this is about 10 years later. Um, but you have in 1879, you've got the Zulu War. Um, you've got uh, the Boer War, the turn of the century, Spanish-American War. Uh, you know, there's a number of, of these conflicts going on um, until you get to the Great War, which, yes, is you know compared to any of the conflicts that were fought in this late colonial period, um, you know, the Great War is going to dwarf all of that. So. Uh, in that sense, it could be a Pax Britannica, and that there was no major conflict. There was no major power um, 
conflict that you know sort of engulfed all of Europe. Even the Franco-Prussian War was really just between Prussia and you know the Ger Germany basically and France at the time. So uh, it was not a wider conflict that drew in other powers, um, but still lots of conflict going on, um, which you know you, you make a game about it, and the game deals with that that conflict that happens in this era. And in fact, one of the ways. Um, the, and, well, I don't remember if it's a victory condition. I've played this once before, and uh, I can't remember if the victory condition is. I mean, basically, you want to prevent World War One from happening, but ultimately, the game sort of ends with World War One. So, um, it's not. I'm thinking of like uh, oh, the founding, the Rick Kelly uh, founding fathers game, where you lose if the Civil War breaks out. Uh, I, I can't remember if this, if you, if in this case, if you. you lose the if World War One breaks out but um, that's been a couple of years ago that I played this um, so regardless of all that um, the, the copy that I had was beat up and when I played this um, I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to get a nicer copy of it um, just because I had to, you know, go through and trim up all the pieces because they were punched out without any care to kind of preserving them. So some of the pieces had tears and stuff on them. You know, this is a 1980s uh, die cut game where the counters, um, you know, were, were glossy and not particularly well die cut. And they, you know, somebody just smashing them out of the counter sheet and they get all you know, dinged up, and, and these are, these have weird, I don't know if there's pictures of the counters in the back, you'll see them shortly anyway when I open the box, um, some of you wondering when that's going to be, it could be, it could be 15 minutes, I don't know, uh, you'll just have to, to see and find out, um, if anybody's watched my unboxing before, you know I can go on for 20 minutes before I even open the box, um, but it has triangular pieces, and, you know, the corners of the edges of these triangular pieces, in an era when die cutting was not particularly good, um, that makes pieces that are tough to, to punch out and potentially end up damaged. Um, one of the more interesting elements of this game, uh, for its era in particular, is the map, which is this, you can see a representative of it here on the back, but I'll show you in, in larger scope uh, once I take it out of the box. Um, it's this polar view of the world, which is, is actually kind of good, um, and just that it's how unique it is, but it also um, I don't, it, it provides this cool snapshot of the, of the whole planet, which you're dealing with at the time. I mean, in this era, the whole world was sort of abuzz with this um, kind of, you know, industrialization and expansion and colonization and exploitation and conquest and so forth. Um, so it, the, the map immediately is eye-catching, and, and in this era, um, this was definitely very unique, and you can see here it's got the uh, what you would kind of consider a point-to-point -point, um, map, but not one of those egregious ones where it's just bubbles and you can't even see what's behind it. The, the world map does very much stand out, um, and lots of unique shaped pieces too. Uh, it's interesting that the marks the complexity is high. Um, I guess there's bookkeeping in it, so that's probably where the where the high complexity comes from. It is not very easy to, uh, to solitaire just because there's a lot of simultaneous action going on um, and you're, you're, you're going to be bookkeeping for all the different powers um, if you're playing it solo, which is kind of a lot of work. So um, here, playing time, 8 to 10 hours, probably pretty accurate. It's not a particularly long game um, in that regard. It would be, you could play it, you know, in a good solid day of gaming or maybe a couple of sessions. Um, so... Having long wanted to replace my beat up copy simply because I, I enjoyed the game so much and it's a, an era that's of such great interest to me, um, I wanted to see if I could find you know a minty copy, uh, like kind of like the copy of Vietnam that I found, which was probably one of the nicest copies of any of the older games that I have. I mean, it was just completely unmarked. It looked like it could have been published yesterday. It was so incredibly in, in such a good condition. This is the same way. It's shrink wrapped, uh, with as is always the case with these old games. There's no way of knowing if this is the original shrink wrap or not. Um, it, it, you know, doesn't look like recent shrink wrapping, but it also doesn't exactly look like it's uh, 
35 years old. So um, we'll see. But the box itself is in fantastic shape. No dinged corners, no creases, no sign of water damage or anything like that. I mean, it looks like a it looks like a brand spanking new box, um, which I like. If you've seen my collection on my shelves, I like neatly arranged boxes. Um, now I've done a lot of box repair and stuff. I did a video on that. Um, on fixing boxes that have have had uh, you know the sides where the sides have been crushed or whatever you can literally iron them with a with a uh, an iron and uh, iron them out flat and glue everything back together but man that's just there's no bowing there's no cave there's no sun damage it's gorgeous love it um, rules now the rules to the game are not actually that long. There's um, the, the center page here. And here's another thing to look for on, on old games. Check the staples. A lot of times in these old games, you'll see rusty staples, which means they were you know, potentially stored in a, in a damp environment. Um, the staples in this are perfectly preserved. The book's nice and crisp. Clearly never been used. Um, but the, uh, the rules here, as you can see, they have a, there's a uh, planning map here in the middle along with the, um, a chart that has a summary of data. This has like your values um, and uh, what areas are actually adjacent to each area. And then there's a map key so you can find the different places because there's a lot of names you might not recognize. Um, so what you do is just pop this out of the center of the book. Um, well, this, was, this was from the era when a lot of times trucks and tables and stuff would be um, yeah, yeah this was nice the Rudyard Kipling poem on the back he is kind of like the ultimate imperialist uh, era British author um, I happen to really enjoy there's another one the White Man's Burden his classic today controversial looking uh, poem basically about imperialism um the designer of this, Greg Kostikian, kind of uh, uh, writes a, in the introduction, and maybe if there's designer's notes. Mm, yeah, the historical viewpoint, kind of, he kind of makes a case for uh, for imperialism. You know, he has some conservative views. I think the same thing showed up in uh, in uh, his viewpoints in uh, in Central America, um, another Vic Victor Games title that he did. Um, but the, the rules themselves are not they're not particularly long. Uh, let's look where the actual rules are. So about 26, 27 pages of rules. Well, that's all the historical viewpoint. So 20, you're looking at 26 pages. Um, so th th there are some ambiguities in the rules. Um, one of the biggest challenges of the game is dealing with the fact that People can basically claim um, provinces simultaneously. It's almost kind of like this free-for-all that happens. Um, and I forget what phase that in. Again, I'm trying to go on memory of the last time I played it, which has been a while. Um, but there's kind of these di the different phases of the game. There's diplomacy where, where characters are kind of talking with each other and dealing with each other, uh, potentially making deals um, on how they want to divide up the spoils uh, of, of the colonial lands, as it were. So, But they are typical victory games rules. Um, you know, just very, very wordy. You're not going to find comprehensive examples of play in this era of, of book with a lot of graphic details. Um, they're not going to be in color. You know, the, again, this was sort of the this company was sort of the spiritual successor to SPI, so um, some similarities in terms of how the rules were were handled um, similar to your SPI era. So here's the counters. And you've got here all the round counters, and these are control counters basically. Um, and then you've got all the the money markers, um, game turn, and so forth. Status assorted status counters. Um, you know, pretty standard for the era. Again, lots of with. Uh, 
with round counters and stuff like this, you're going to get the weirdly placed nubs um, that hold everything in there. And so, you know, even when, when, I, when I've punched these out, I have to go through with my trusty rotary cutter and do a lot of trimming um, to get, you know, the side nibs um, off. And the, that's just how it was uh, for this particular era. You can see the die cutting is not super great. Counters are not all uniform size, so forth and so on. Um, all these round counters maybe remind me of... Uh, Avalon Hills Dune. Um, so this is the counter sheet three of three, I believe. Um, here is, yeah, you can tell this has never been used, um, so even if it had been opened and re-shrink wrapped, um, the power sheets, which show you how to do your setup um, for each of the different powers. These are the minor powers, Spain, Netherlands, Belgium, and Portugal. Um, and then on the back, this is Treaty of the Congress of Europe. So like there's a thing where you could actually <laughs> write out treaties uh, between powers if you wanted. Um, but each of the powers, this is the sort of thing that would be on cardstock nowadays, uh, but this was put together. Um, basically each power will have their sheet that has their setup and so forth on it. Um, and that has their administrative records um, for the start of you know where they're collecting money at. Um, and then their income and maintenance costs, uh, which are going to be, I believe, different by different by power. Uh, and each power is going to have its own um, setup information and different goals where they can, uh, or different things that, that they can influence on the board. Um, on the back of each chart, then everybody has their own CRT. And this is all the stuff that I believe, aside from the colors, um, is all going to be similar. Just trying to remember. It's going to be similar amongst the powers and not particularly uh, different. Here's your Germany, Austria, Hungary sheet. As you can see, they all have these different things here. Here's where the German relations, how Germany and Austria, Hungary function as kind of one power. Um, but there, you can see here, same thing on the back, they have the CRT. So everybody sort of has general um, charts on the back. So aside from the colors, those are all the same. The big bad for the game, Great Britain. Um, and as you can see, they have a lot more to set up because they have a giant sprawling empire. Um, we've got Italy, way less to set up, not a giant sprawling empire. Uh, you know, and this, this is not... It's not a particularly balanced game. Um, I think the, the balance is handled similar to the way it is in EIA, which is, or Empires in Arms rather, which is um, the more powerful countries have more to do and more points to score uh, in order to actually win, whereas the lesser powerful countries can do less um, to win. So it's sort of an asymmetrical system. Um, at least that's how I'm remembering it. It could be. Totally wrong on that, uh, but you know, it's still even with, you know, whatever the different power victory conditions are, um, it's going to be hard to win, you know, with a country like Russia or, um, or Germany. And so these countries that did not particularly project uh, global power in an imperial sense at the time. Um, and then there's the United States, the, the new guy on the block uh, in, this, in this particular era. So that's kind of cool. These are all still attached in a little... Um, pad, you'll, you'll split them all up and hand them out to the players. Here's your administrative record sheets. This is where you're going to do all your bookkeeping for each power. These are the same for every power. Um, and you're just counting, you know, by year, um, all your different assets that you have, your income and then your maintenance, what, what all your um, units and stuff are costing you, doing your net, keeping track of your victory points. And your down here, you get your military purchase costs. Um, on the back, movement status change, restriction summary, bonus point victory summary. Here's yeah, here's all your victory points that you would count up at the end of the game. Movement and so forth. So nice pad of. Record sheets. Next counter sheet. This is counter sheet number one. Let's 
So these are all your British pieces. But again, you can see here, very strange um, for the era of having these triangular counters, um, fairly unusual. Another one's in Austria-Hungary. Uh, looks like the die cutting is pretty well centered, but again, you know, very sort of almost this kind of wavy looking die cutting. Um, that's just a, that's an element of this particular era of games. There's the map, we'll get to that in a second. And the other counter, counter sheet number two, with all the other powers, you can see how many more British pieces there were. There you've got Japan. United States, Germany, yeah, see this sort of stuff where the die cutting like takes this big dip, you know, just just how it was in that particular era. But again, everything looks um, centered enough, you know, some a little a little off center there. But you flip it over to the back as long as everything's there. Um, you know, nothing's completely off the edges of the counters. Um, might be flirting with the edge, but but otherwise okay. So I, the, the, one of the reasons I wanted to get a, a cleaner copy of this was so that I could punch the counters out myself with the care needed to a make it take less time to clean them up after I've I've punched them all out. So basically, I cut them out with a rotary cutter and or a, a, an exacto knife, and then you know trim up again any of the side nubs and stuff that are on there, which you're going to find um, you know on, on unusually shaped counters like these. And there's the other map. And then all I got in there is one of these horrible victory games uh, counter trays with the with the snap and attached lid, which is really just a recipe to um, send your counters flying all over the place. When you pop the lid open, the counters go out of the... So these things are pretty terrible. Good old GMT counter sheets are, are the best I've found. Um, these are okay if you slice the, use a razor to slice the actual hinged part of the lid off so it's actually two pieces. And even then, um, it, it, they, they can stick enough that they uh, can still pop open and end up scattering all your counters. So let's lay these maps out. I'll pick up the camera. And, and uh, one of the, uh, this is a very, very, very minty copy of this game. I'm super happy. <laughs> but the this map is just oh these these uh Victory Games maps were so like this just this heavy, heavy, heavy paper. Uh, but they also pooch very much, so you really have to use plexi with these. It's just about impossible, even if you were to backfold them, just about impossible to play. Um, just about impossible sorry I'm lining this up here just about impossible to play this without plexi um, you, again even if you're back folding it's going to be pretty pretty poochy so um, there we have the whole thing laid out let me pan back with the camera a little bit here and you can see just this really gorgeous map and it, you could argue, yes, there's kind of a lot of dead space in the oceans there. Um, it's not a game that has a lot of charts, so unlike you know a typical hex encounter war game, you're not going to have a uh, you know this huge proliferation of charts that can take up a lot of the dead space um, that you would have here. And you know it ends up with a lot of the pe a lot of the the activity is all happening on the Europe. Africa and Asia map, and it kind of leaves the Americas over here. You can see not a whole lot of spaces. Um, you do still have a lot going on, obviously, with the United States and the Caribbean. Um, I remember there being actually quite a bit of conflict there. It may have been the Spanish-American War um, that I was fighting out at the time. Uh, but then, you know, they've put on here the massive uh, random events table, which is pretty cool. It has the random events in this, you know, have all of your different historical uh, Elements, you know, historical actions and things that were happening um, in that era, where you've got, you know, the different the governments of Britain that are that are changing things. You've got war in the Balkans. You can see there immediately increased the European tensions index by four. This is where you're getting, you know, close to running into World War One when you've got things like that going on. 
um, but you've got stuff in China, um, you know, here, the stuff in America, you've got the yellow press, your, your lead up to the Spanish American war, um, German stuff going on, South African pressure for dominion, all these things here, different, uh, elements of the British empire going for dominion, assorted unrest. Yeah. Then you've got, you're, you're always making these rolls every turn then to see what areas, what areas you've got unrest in that you need to try and quash. Um, militarily and then your your turn track your phase track and you know there's a lot of phases per turn um, your war sequence when you've got wars going on just uh, again this whole era is so fascinating to me so um, that's just one of the real appeals to the game like I love kind of shepherding a great power through this particular era in time and uh uh, I don't know, there's just something of all the, with all the literature I've read on this era, um, I just love it as a study and kind of a, a sandbox in a way of world power and, and the influence of world power in this particular era. So it's really just a cool game that, that, that tracks that very specific era, which is, you know, 1880 to the Great War. I mean, you've got the, the years right there on the turn track. You're going... 1880 right up to 1916 so it is definitely you know it's not a long era you're not doing a really long era of history but it was a very unique era and a very very influential era in history in terms of how it set the stage um, for the great war which then went on itself to define the entire 20th century and even into today so um, really really excited that I found a a very very nice um, collector's copy of this um, I don't I'm not going to leave it unpunched um, even though you know, again I already have a punched copy um, I want to be able to punch this out with the care uh, that I think it deserves um, but I intend definitely intend to actually play it and uh, not just have it adorn my shelf um, but it is really cool to have really nice 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 collector's copy and usually I'm content to buy players copies of games it's very rare that I go out and buy a game a second time uh, you know once I've spent the money I've spent the money I don't want to spend it again um, but this game had a I have a particular fondness for and uh, uh, you know finding a really really gorgeous copy of it um, was something that was kind of a goal so Anyway, there's a look at Pax Britannica. Anna gave me a, a chance to do an unboxing of an old game, an unpunched copy of an old game. These are This is something I love to do, but I don't buy as many copies of old games anymore because I've, I've pretty much acquired now all the ones that I wanted. Um, you know, not all of which I got unpunched simply because I, you know, you, don't, you, you pay a premium to get things unpunched. This game was not particularly expensive, even unpunched. Um, when I saw there was a shrink-wrapped shrink copy on the Board Game Geek Marketplace, I opted to just go for it. It was, uh, you know, only 50 bucks. So, um, you know, an unpunched, or a punched copy of this game, you can probably find in the, in the $30 range. Um, but to get a shrink-wrapped, you know, minty, gorgeous box copy for 50 bucks, I, I just kind of splurged and indulged myself um, in that regard. But uh, to me, worth it to have for a game that I, I really, really enjoy. So uh, there you have it, a look at Pax Britannica. Victory Games from 1985.